The 8051 was a microcontroller that Intel produced in the 1980s for embedded programming. It turned out to be very popular. The 8031 is essentially a ROMless version of the 8051 and strictly speaking if you disable the internal memory on an 8051 by grounding pin 31, that's the EA pin, it too becomes an 8031. Due to their popularity, both the 8051 and 31 were produced by a number of different manufacturers. Whilst early examples were made using NMOS technology, later versions such as the two I have here were produced using the CMOS process which gave them much lower power consumption, hence were better suited for portable battery operation. I've had this pair of ATC31s sitting around for many years, so decided at long last to give at least one of them a go. Bear in mind that these are my first experiments with the 8031, so I'll be reporting on my own personal findings, which could well be different to anyone who really has a thorough knowledge, and perhaps liking, of the device. Let's quickly run through the features of it then. There are actually four separate 8-bit parallel ports, two timers, a serial port facility, four sets of registers, and some onboard RAM. All very useful, but we have to remember that with the 8031, Three out of the four 8-bit ports are utilised for the external memory, therefore it's more realistic to say it just has one 8-bit parallel port when you're using an external ROM. For smaller applications, the onboard RAM saves additional device if you, if you might not need one, plus the four sets of internal registers. While this all sounds very useful and impressive, I have to say I personally found the memory map of the 8031 rather confusing at first. Yes, it has all these registers and memory, but if you look at the memory map it takes a while to understand exactly what is where. Bear in mind that some memory locations overlap as well, so can only be accessed by certain instructions etc. Obviously when one understands it a bit better then that's not a problem, but certainly it start, it's a bit confusing at first I think. Note that at 0080 hex is a large bank of special function registers. A lot of the microcontroller's features are controlled from these. Like most other micros, there's several addressing modes as you can see here. However, there is a very large explanatory section I have chosen not to put up here online, which ought to be read in one of the manuals, because some of the features and particular locations, such as the stack, are pre-allocated, etc., and you need to bear that in mind when using the RAM. Well worth printing out one of these particular charts if you're planning on doing a spot of 8031 programming as I found it particularly useful. Note that it's actually rather difficult to find certain commonplace instructions due to the way the codes are allocated. There are, for example, seem, seemingly no specific instructions for the 8-bit ports. Hence one can use the 3-byte move a direct hash data command where the first byte is the 75 hex, second being 90 hex which accesses port 1 special function register and lastly the third byte being the data you actually want to send to the port. Of course there are other instructions that do a similar job such as the 2 byte MOV direct a instruction where the first byte is an F5 and the second could be a 90 once again addressing the special function register. When I'm new to a micro I like to sit down and spend a while working out some common instructions to start myself off with this because this is uh, as you see here. Obviously if you're using an assembler or a higher language program then um, this is not really necessary though it can lead to a better understanding of the code when you're starting out. I personally find it helps one understand the programming ways of a specific device when all is currently unknown as it was with me and the 8031. So let's have a quick look at the working schematic straight away. One can see the 8051 was better in some respects with its internal ROM as it makes the circuit much more compact, also freeing up the ports for use, which of course are used by the external memory. Using the 8051 it's therefore possible to make some very powerful circuits with a very low chip count. Whilst you can see both the ROM and the RAM in this arrangement, it's always possible there might be sufficient onboard RAM to make the external device unnecessary. For my first 8031 test board, I naturally included one in case I needed it in a latter configuration. The 138 decoder is a useful little IC that allows to give us up to six external devices in addition to the external ROM and RAM. Note the micro has an onboard oscillator which will use up to a 20 meg crystal. Useful. Likewise, the internal reset circuitry has a SMIT trigger already in there, therefore making it unnecessary for an external reset IC. Anybody fancy trying? Trying out an 8031, here's a screen grabbable netlist which you can use to build the circuit I'm about to show you. Here we have a ROM temporarily uh, blown with the code and we've zoomed in on it so we can show you pins 1 to 8 are in fact um, the I.O. port we're talking about. So we turn on the, the power, LED comes on 
and we have a logic probe we're just going to use a logic probe for this and hopefully we should actually see that note how the logic probe is flashing it has a pulse stretcher in it which means that basically it can be running up to any speed within the logic probes capabilities it just flashes on and off at the same rate see all of them are toggling and that one is the last one nothing so that is essentially showing us if you press the reset button everything goes high on reset with, with the port until it resets yep and we're off again there we go very simple that's actually showing us that this is working correctly For this second ROM, test ROM, call it, um, we're going to use the DL1414 display, which is going to test that the RAM works. Uh, one thing I always think about is how can you test the RAM works? We did it with the 8080, if anybody watched the 8081, and it's quite straightforward. We simply send something via the RAM to the display and something straight through to the display, and if only one appears, uh, the one that doesn't go through the RAM, then you know that there's it's it's not it's obviously not being uh, read and written to correctly. So if we turn this on, you'll see what I mean. So if I put this in the way, it actually helps you see what's on there. On the display, we have yeah. we have a a minus and an A. The minus is being sent direct from the CPU and the program. Whereas the A is written into the RAM and then read back out again and sent to the display. So if the RAM is not being read, we'll simply have the minus and no A. Very simple enough. So let's take the RAM out and prove the points. We take this thing off for a start. Let's turn it off. Let's find some suitable thing to remove the RAM with. My fingers. RAM is gone. So if we now, that means we still have the program, everything else is, nothing has changed. Let's put that back there so we can actually see it. And let's see what happens when we turn this on. We just have a minus. And that is the thing that's being sent direct. The, the A was being sent via the RAM. So if it's read, if this segment is read out of the RAM, there's no RAM, nothing is read, or at least more to the point, it's probably an FF because all the signals high and there isn't an FF actually decoded decoded within this display so let's turn it off once again put the RAM back in again balance that again and see what happens hey presto we have the A again so I think we can say that definitely confirms that the RAM is working before you think you're seeing double, no, they have not multiplied. This is another one, completely different to this one, in as much as it's still the 8031, it still has the uh, decoder here for the address and data lines, and a ROM. Interestingly, there's no RAM at all, there's obviously no display, there's no I.O. This has a specific use. Uh, when I was playing around with this earlier on, I thought, what I need is for a radar room thing we need another morse code generator just something to generate a morse code um, repetitively so that we can actually you know use it for demonstration purposes and so i thought hey why not use one of these so of course i thought of maybe using this one i thought it's a bit of a waste because i already have put the ram in it and i put these other bits i could use this for something else so why not build a second one so that's where this one came in so in fact this is exactly the same as that one other than the fact that it only has the bare minimum of components. So in fact, when it comes down to it, this is the 31 is almost as small as it would be with the 51. It just has these extra ones here. Um, so that's that's uh, about, about the long and the short of it. So what I've done is we've written a program here, which actually will be used um, uh, for demo purposes. This is a little sounding box, a squawker thing. It does squawk terribly badly. Um, it all works fine. So what I'll do is I'll put the clip on here so if we can put the logic clip on here so we can actually take off from one of the pins that's there and we'll take pin one because remember that's p p1 port one and we've connected that up to that so technically if i turn this on it should simply start doing its morse code 
and it'll loop round. So let's see what happens. There we go, and hence it will loop round in this infinite um, loop. That's it. So that's our little demo, I think, of the 8031. It's quite an interesting IC, as having used it <clears throat> to make these and write the programs. There's some very good things about it, but I still think it's the way they go about using some of it. Because bear in mind that the IO, well, single I.O. port left now, if we're going to use this arrangement on the 31, um, you can configure any of the pins for inputs or outputs. And I was reading through it about half an hour ago and I thought you know this is really complicated and they they have the very it's where they use FETs for pull-ups and stuff and they say you know you can use you know one pin as an input one pin as an output and you can reconfigure them and you can use them within interrupts it's it's complicated if you don't mind spending the time doing it it's an extremely versatile little device I'm not quite so sure that I'll ever go into the the depths of working out separate pins for inputs and outputs but hey one never knows anyway there we go, you know, there's a few details I put up at the end, um, so you can actually take some screenshots of them if you're interested. This circuit at least works, and maybe you can do a, a better job yourself. Any questions, please ask them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.